you so much for being here. That's such a wonderful film. I'm going to start off with a few questions and then open it out to you guys. So if you think of questions while we're talking. Uh, but to start off with, I think one of the things that I love about it is that there's so many layers to the film and it's so intimate and you the way you weave through the personal and your family history into the wider social history and it's so powerful to see the political contextualized with the personal and I was wondering if if you could talk about the idea your original idea and where your inspiration came from so uh, originally I thought I was making something else I thought I was making a film in which the main character would be the door. Uh, and what I knew that remained unchanged until the end is that it would be a film that would never leave that space. So that the apartment would become this kind of microcosm of history. Um, and my inspiration at the time was this novel um, by Thomas Mann, which is the Budenbrooks, which is a novel that uh, uses the chronicle of a family of four generations of a German family to tell you something about the history of Germany, but that's really not the principal theme. It's something that emerges in the background of the novel. And I really appreciated that as a form. And I, th I was just thinking that I've never seen, I've never seen the story of my country told in the way that I had lived it, mm -hmm. um, particularly of the 90s. I, I feel, you know, um, I think Serbia's image in the media in the 90s was you know, very determined by certain things, ma mainly maybe because the story had to be told in a very simplistic or simplified way. And so I just never felt that I recognized any of what I had lived through or experienced or seen in any of the media narratives that had emerged. So that was also a m motivating factor. But I wanted to try and tell it from a very, very intimate and personal point of view, because it, 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 over time it's become the only point of view I trust. Um, and I just felt it might open, you know, some kind of understanding of uh, of larger things. It wasn't really to give a history lesson on Serbia, because that's not really possible to do in one film, and it didn't really interest me. But it was really to open all these questions. Mm -hmm. The thing is that I didn't count on the factor of my mother. She really um, I took over <laughs> at some <laughs> point, um, and she didn't know. I I sh I shifted gears. Uh, mainly during the editing. The editing lasted for a year and a half because I realized that what had happened is I had grown, it took me five years to make the film, I had kind of grown up during the time of making it and I, for the first time in my life, instead of watching her as a daughter watches a mother and I had taken very much for granted everything she had done, I started watching her as an adult mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I began to realize that many of the things she'd done in her life were actually choices that she had made and I had no understanding of where the choices came from. I had a really hard time understanding where the conviction um, and the courage to do what she did came from. Mm. And so I, be I realized that over time, the questions I was asking her had taken us into a different film. So that's the film you saw, basically. Mm. <laughs> what was the process like working with filming your mother? Did, <laughs> <laughs> did it change like, yeah. the dynamic? And um, the problem was my mother was so used to teaching and she's so used to speaking, giving interviews, that um, she spoke to me as if I was a journalist in the beginning. She spoke, you wouldn't have realized that she's speaking to her daughter from the mm. way she was speaking. And that really drove me crazy. And it took me a long time to find the ways in which to bring her into that particular mood and that particular space where it's just the two of us and all we're doing is talking and there's no need to teach. And, um, and that took a long time. It really took a long time. It's not that I discovered things I didn't know because from the age of 11, when the war began and she became active, I followed her to every rally that she went to and, 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 and so I knew her story. So it wasn't really discovering stuff I didn't know. It was more a, a need to discover where that was came from and also did you know do you not look back after so much failure and think what a waste of time so there was all these things I mean the problem was in me it wasn't in her there was something working in me that I was trying to get through, you know to the bottom of mm. there's this moment when um, I think she's talking about the food and the supermarkets and I was really interested to know how aware you were of how much she sort of worked to keep you all alive and what the situation of... And also there were so many 
occasions it seemed where people, friends would come around and talk about politics and it seemed like a really lively space for debate. So I was wondering mm. about how you grew up in that. Um, so to answer your first question, uh, not very. They protected us as much as you know any parent would. And I'll, I'll never forget that the, the, the click for me happened with the NATO bombing. I was, you know, I was a student by then, but watching my, you know, family friends who had much younger kids, there is this moment during the bombing when you see the you see the look in the kids' eyes when they realize their their parents cannot protect them from what is about to happen, and that's a really awful thing to see in a child's face. You know, just this moment of uh, there is no protective cocoon anymore. Your parents are as helpless as you are. So I remember that really clearly as something that struck me um, as irreparable, really. Um, but to answer your second question, it was a key thing for me. The, the home that I grew up in was always a political salon, um, even in my grandparents' time. And what I loved about it is that what you see, and I tried to, you know, I, I, I thought that this would, there would be more scenes in the film like that, but um, in the end it turned out that we didn't need them. What I love is that you see people who fundamentally disagree politically, but fundamentally, I mean, we're, you know, pro-war, anti-war, nationalist, Democrat, uh, pro-Russian, pro-American. And the beauty of it is that they are lifelong friends. They're childhood friends. And, and these friendships have lasted for 70 years now. Mm -hmm. And it was just this thought that, you know, I grew up in a house in which it was possible to disagree politically and still talk. Mm -hmm. And But I didn't grow up in a country in which it was possible to disagree politically and still talk. And I just wanted to make a film that creates a space in which you can talk. And, and I think it's also the reason why I called it the other side of everything. It was just this feeling of we're not going to make any progress as a country because we're always in the search of the final truth, you know, the final truth about communism, the final truth about Milosevic. And I, I just keep thinking we're not going to make any progress as a country until we open up a space in which we acknowledge that people live through that era in, in very different ways because we were so divided and that there is enough space for all of those stories to be told otherwise you know mm. we're just gonna be stuck in this um in this division a lot of it did seem as well like it was a process for you trying to figure out how your mum had worked politically and how like you were considering well what what now what next yeah. and what can i do yeah there's something very wrong at the end of the film, which is that, you know, a woman who's now 70 is the optimist and her daughter is the pessimist. There's something very wrong about that balance of, <laughs> uh, and I know that. And someone said to me at one point, you've made a very sad film. And I said, I did because I am very sad. I think my mother's maybe the blessing of that generation, which is the 68 generation, is that they really grew up thinking that one individual could make a difference and change the world. And I wonder sometimes whether it's the fact that my generation watched theirs fail um, that we are a lot more prone to switching off um, and not really believing that uh, our engagement has any sense. And so I, I don't know, it's just, it's, you know, obviously, obviously at the end when she's looking at me and saying, okay, now, you know, now it's your turn and, and, I, and I say I, I can't. Uh, a lot of young people came up to me in many places, even in, in the United States, and they said, I, I don't think, I don't feel like she's looking at you, I feel like she's looking at me, and it's a very uncomfortable stare. Mm -hmm. And it is, and I, I kind of hope that it is. I hope the film does make people as uncomfortable as I feel. Mm. <laughs> I think that's a good place to open up to the audience. So, do we have questions? Don't be shy. There's a question at the back, and then we'll come to you at the front, if you just wait for the mic. Hi, thank you for the film. Um, it just it feels to me that the point actually you made throughout the film, especially towards the end, is that there's a lack of voice, or actually a lack of willingness to engage on the newer generations. And I don't just mean in Serbia, across regions like this where polarization of opinion happens. I'm Romanian and it happens in my country quite a lot. It happens in Poland, it happens in Hungary, across the region. It happens in UK actually, massively. And um, here, however, people engage with it. I'm not sure how efficient, though, but they do. So that's, um, it's, I think it's more of a commentary, but it's, uh, um, is this a film, is this film your way, actually, of speaking out, speaking, and you have an opinion? Because actually she's looking at you, mm -hmm. and people like you, like me, to make, take a stand. Mm -hmm. Is this how you take a stand, actually? No, no I, I've been asked that, and actually, to be honest with you, what I thought I was doing was that I was trying to be incredibly 
honest in um I see it as a mea culpa. I think I was uh, apologizing to my mother and to myself and to my country for the fact that it's not going to be me. Uh, that's how I see what I was doing. What's happened since the film came out, however, uh, it has, has actually made me think, wait, maybe this, you know, maybe this does open a conversation that I didn't realize it would open. But when I was making it, it was very much about saying that I'm, that, you know, you see her cleaning the silver, and it's obviously a very metaphoric scene. It's this idea of heritage. It's something that's about to be transmitted to me that I don't really want. Nobody wants to end up cleaning silver for the rest of their life. So there is this whole thing of there's a, herit a moral heritage that's being passed to you, and, and, and I don't actually want it. I mean want it. I don't know what to do with it. Um, and so I was trying to be incredibly honest about that, you know, that... I'm probably going to be one of those who walked away or ran away or, or switched off, but not the one who, 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 who raised their voice. That's, uh, that's how I see it. But my mother was asked, actually. We did a Q&A together after some screenings, and, and someone said to her, OK, your daughter is not capable of giving speeches, but she's made this film, and it's her way of giving a speech. And my mother said, maybe, but it's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Just so, sorry to add to this. Uh, but you see, you had this comment in the film but the young generation, uh, in, spite of the, in spite of the whole political country saying that oh, Americans are bad, Germans are, ba are bad because they bomb our country, but the actually younger generations flee mm -hmm. to these countries. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, you end up with countries like America, which stand for, for, for a principle, for an ideal, which is as divided as this nation, yeah. as Serbia is. So where is that force? You flee from something terrible to some other place. Well, actually, will you fail to act and actually, it's, it's not just the statement. I think the younger generation do have a voice. It's just, you know, feeling that you you can't stand, for, you can't make a difference. It's, mm. it's just silly. There are certain people who feel they can make a difference. They take the power. They end up be, being slobbered on Russia. And true. that's sad. I, I had so in, at the U, in the U.S. Someone said something to me that really struck me. They said, you know, but if you're not in, if you're not willing to get involved, how is your government ever going to look like you? And I was thinking, that's actually a really good point. But it, it, but, it, but it does come down to what my mother was saying. You either have it in you and you're, or you don't. And my problem is, I studied political science. I thought, I thought that was going to be my path. And then we had the revolution. And I can't explain to you the extent to which I lost my political faith after seeing what happens to a movement that is resistant in its nature once it's forced to govern. That's where it all broke apart for me. And it's really funny because a few years ago I was in Egypt with my previous film at a screening in Cairo and it was the weekend of the first presidential elections in Egypt after their revolution. And I went to Tahrir Square and what was amazing to me is that I saw all of the enthusiasm and the euphoria and the energy that I had felt on the day of our revolution in Belgrade. But I was looking at these young people as if I was a hundred years older than them uh, with so much bitterness thinking you guys have no idea that this is the high point of your life and that everything from here is just going to be a long downward spiral. So it's just to explain to you my state of mind, which is really not positive. Um, and that's what I was trying to be incredibly honest about. But you're absolutely right. You know, someone has to, someone has to speak up. Thank you. We've got a question down here, and then we'll go to you. Thank you. First, I really want to thank you for your film. It was incredible. And not only the storytelling, but the way the shots are beautiful and yeah, I'm, I'm amazed. Um, but also my background is political science and dissolution of Yugoslavia. I've been in Slovenia and Croatia. And I'm grateful for your film because it's a Serbian perspective. Most of the documentaries we see on the topic is Serbia is seen from, you know, it's Milosevic, basically. And it's the enemy and it's the bad thing. And now you're showing a, such a humane perspective. And that's incredible. Um, so my question is, how did you find the film first? Because I saw that it's like Serbian Film Center, and <laughs> I'm curious about that. And also, what do you fundamentally disagree with your mother? Like, I saw this hint where you're criticizing her for reclaiming the other side. And how do you feel about that? And how do you feel in general about the process of giving justice to the proletariat and the bourgeois like this topic is quite interesting because it sounds just it sounds 
idealistic, but your family had its opinion. So, yeah. uh, um, wait, <laughs> let me see. Um, to, to, to answer your, your, the last part of your question first, I actually thought I would make two films. I thought there would be this side and then there would be on the other side. And I actually filmed, so I grew up without any contact or any really clear idea of what the people on the other side looked like. They were invisible to us and we were invisible to them. I'd never entered that space before I was, before maybe, before the year I started making the film really. Uh, and Nada was the only one left alive on that side. So I filmed a lot with her. And her story was extraordinary because she's kind of the silent witness of our family history and on the same time I discovered her side of the story and um, so for a long time I thought there would be two films and then this film you'd never see her um, I was very much inspired by Hitchcock's Rebecca which is a film that really works because you never see the main character um, but then I realized somewhere along the way that I can't make a story that she's not part of because if the whole idea is that there are many sides then you have to see the other side in this film uh, but just to say that I personally, and this is going to sound strange to you, but m my family is very socially democrat, just not communist. And, and, and that might seem like a very thin line, but, um, but there is a difference. Uh, and so I personally don't actually know that I think that fundamentally there is a problem with this idea of redistribution of, of property. You know, I don't think that per se that was a problem. The problem is the antagonism that was created in the living space but I don't know actually, you know, uh, Belgrade was destroyed after the Second World War. There was a real housing shortage. I mean, in, in and of itself, what happened isn't so extraordinary, outrageous. It's, it's kind of the mentality that was bred as a result of this idea of kind of entrenched differences, you know, that cannot communicate and so on. And so, yes, there is a moment in the film where my mother, who is like all about this is not the way to right the wrongs of the past, you know, blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, she's filling in the forms for restitution. And I was a little <laughs> bit like, wait a minute. And I love how she turns the table on us. And she's like, OK, so let's all just, you know, renounce on this heritage. And all of a sudden, it's principle meets practicality. And, you know, <laughs> obviously, practicality wins because, like, who's going to say no to this apartment? But do you know what I mean? She really tests our principles there. So um, I, I maybe it's. There's a lot more contradiction in all of us than you know we're kind of willing to present to to others. In the Serbian Film Center. Oh, the film, Serbian it. Film Center. It was very easy. I didn't I didn't describe the film this way when I cast <laughs> for money. <laughs> have, have they seen it? Uh, so the head of the film center saw it and he really likes it. The Ministry of Culture, which kind of by protocol you you invite to the premiere, the national premiere, because they're the they fund the film center. They never came. And it's happened to me several times that, like, when I'm doing a screening abroad, I'll contact the Serbian embassy and I'll say, it would be so nice if you could forward the info on the screening to your mailing list. And they say, yeah, 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 we do that all the time. And then they write back two days later, when I send them the info, they're, actually, we can't forward this to the members on our, on our mailing list. So that kind of stuff happens. But nothing, I mean, it's a documentary, so it kind of passes under the radar. Yeah. And we have one at the back. Thank, thank you for the film, which I find fascinating. I'm electrical engineer and a uh, friend of your mother. We, we were in the same year at the electrical engineer in Belgrade. The, but then I came here and she stayed to fight the battle. The, the, uh, you, you pointed out, and I think she mentioned uh, two kinds of people, us and them, and how can they do this and why do they not understand us. Very similarly here where I also fought a little battle against Milosevic from the comfort of my armchair. Um, it, we had the same uh, polarity in, in diaspora. So going back to Serbia now and you showing this film, do you think there will be again some people who will say, well, we like it, or some people will say, we don't like it, we don't agree with your film? When I was making it, it was incredibly important for me to try and reach beyond the audience that agrees with us politically, because what's the point, you know? So I was hoping that the film is open enough in a way to invite people who disagree to at least watch it, you know, and then maybe even reflect on it. And just the other week, for example, it happened to me that I was talking to some businessman in Belgrade and he said to me, you know, my mother, who's really absolutely against everything your mother stands for, she really liked your film. And those kinds of comments really help because then you think, okay, now we're talking, you know, now we've opened the door to some kind of communication because I really, I don't know how far this 
um, divisiveness, and I felt it so strongly in the U.S. when my mother and I went on tour there. You know, this idea of there's us and there's them, and them they must be stupid because they don't think like us. And I don't actually know how how far that divisiveness is going to get us as a society because at some point, you know, we need to start talking. And I was hoping that people would be receptive enough to see this film as an invitation to that conversation. And it has happened in some limited ways. It has happened. What was really nice when the film came out in cinemas in Serbia is how many young people went to see it, but really young, 16, 17 year old. And I did a lot of Q and A's because I was trying to understand what was going on. The film was sold out for two months in cinema. And uh, and what happened is, you know, in one of these Q and A's, one really young high school girl, they sh she stood up and she said, "I want to thank you because no one's ever told us this story, and also because I would have never a trusted my parents to tell it to me." And then you go, "Wow, we really have a problem. <laughs> we have a problem of narrative. You know, we have a problem because we're so divided that we can't even agree on how to tell that story to a younger generation." And I think that's what where where, where we get stuck. Just a small aside, the second paragraph of your brochure is historically very inaccurate. I don't know who I didn't write, I haven't actually seen the brochure, to be yeah. honest, so it's good that you well, tell me. Good, good job, you didn't write. <laughs> okay, we've got one question. Is it the gentleman in the oh, blue? This gentleman. Yeah, and then we'll go to uh, the, you just Thank you very much for the film, it was wonderful. Uh, as I must admit, as an English man, I was brought up thinking that Tito was, you know, I mean, as a socialist myself, I was brought up that uh, Tito was uh, sort of holding the country together. Um, anyway, um, yeah, we all live and learn. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, in the film, your mother said that all countries' borders are created by conferences. Small and countries' borders, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's happening again today in a lot of other countries. Uh, um, now, is I wanted to ask you about the way that the United States was supporting a Milosevic. And I was wanted to ask you, do you think that what happened to your countries, Croatia and Serbia, that you were just pawns in a game? <laughs> um, just first, to, to go back to Tito, I made my first film about Tito, and even though I come from an anti-communist family, by the end of making my first film, I had really deepened my appreciation of the role he had played in Yugoslavia. So I... I, I, I would love to show you that film as well before you form your final conclusion on Tito's role, because he was holding the country together. There was no denying it. Um, but <laughs> moving on to the US. There, it's a very easy way out to say someone else did this to us, you know. And even though I think of most of our destiny has been shaped by great power interests, not just American, but also Russian and also European, German and French. Um, you know, they had to have willing collaborators in the fact that, you know, someone had to end up going to war and, and perpetrating all this violence. So I, I, I find it sometimes it's an easy way out to blame the Americans and blame so on. But they played a very cynical game in the Balkans, a very cynical game. Um, and just as someone who was in the opposition, um, what happened, you know, in a very kind of specific moment is that in the war ended in 95, in 96, 97, we had these huge protests against Milosevic, which were so successful that you felt his grip on power, you know, begin to, sh to shake. You could really, we were getting somewhere. And then the leaders of the protest were summoned to Paris, and they were told in no uncertain terms by the European Union that the Milosevic was the guy who was holding the peace accord together and we needed to back off. And they came back to Belgrade and they held a rally and they said, we have to back off. And then to have Europe come back three years later and say, actually, no, he's a butcher of the Balkans. You know, he's the bad guy, you Serbs don't get it. And we're gonna bomb you back to the Stone Age because you don't get it. It felt a, a huge betrayal of, you know, it's very hard to be the democratic opposition and to go around villages in Serbia and to try and rally people saying to them, we want to build a democracy like the West and then that West shows up and bombs you for reasons that are very difficult to explain. Obviously, you know, I won't go any further into that, but do, do you, you understand what yeah, I mean? It, it yeah. becomes very, very difficult to defend the values that, you know, is supposedly the West is, is there to espouse. Um, and the European Union is playing an even more cynical game today in Serbia, because what we have now is, as you see, a nationalist government which is fully supported by the EU because they're going to do the one thing that the European Union cares about in the Balkans, which is they're going to recognize Kosovo. And because 
these guys will do the thing that is important for the EU, they don't actually care whether there is an authoritarian bend to that system, whether the freedom of the media is being dismantled, whether the judiciary system is being destroyed, because he will deliver what they want to deliver. And I think they don't understand the consequences this has, because I'm a voter in Serbia, I'm, I feel part of Europe, I feel it, that we are part of European civilization, but if you ask me a referendum, do I want to be part of a European Union that is capable of being that cynical, I don't actually know. So I think it has consequences that the EU hasn't really fully thought through in this, you know. Yeah, because uh, um, that was why I thought that your countries may have been pawns in the game. Yeah. But the only thing is when you say that, and I agree with that, but then, then it, that clears of, of all responsibility and agency, and I'm not too willing to do that. We've got time for one last question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. Um, Milosevic died before the court gave their verdict at the instant, well, at the crimes, war crimes tribunal. And what came out during the trial, as you, I'm sure you all know, was a lot of documentary objective evidence on a lot of the atrocities. Do you think, first and foremost, if that r verdict had come out, and a lot of us will speculate as to what it would have been, um, there would have been any sort of resolution between the polarised sides. Do you think any any of the people that were so fundamentally in favour of Milosevic would have accepted culpability, responsibility, would have accepted that when you see those images of genocide in Srebrenica, they would have accepted it once and for all. And secondly, you talk about the younger generations coming to your um, screening, which is great. Do you hope that, because it's very, it's very recent, do you hope that in the future, in the near future, the current or next generations will find that common ground and that it will become something that unites, unites them? Do you think that there's hope for Serbia it, it, with the future oh. generations? Sorry. <laughs> well, we, that, that's a question for a whole evening's discussion, but let me, let me try and answer very briefly. Um, somewhere towards the end of the 90s when it became clear that, you know, one day the system would change. Um, Alex Borain came to Belgrade. Alex Borain was one of the people who was instrumental in setting up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And he came to hold a seminar on how you set up and run a, a commission. And one thing that he told us then that was really astounding was that, I, and I hadn't known that, is that after South Africa, that model had been applied in I'm going to exaggerate now, I don't remember if it was 15 countries or 17 countries, but it only worked that one time. Mm -hmm. And it kind of drove home to us how difficult it would be to establish this, uh, you know, this idea of reconciliation via um, narrative, via people coming out and publicly saying what had happened. Um, so already then, to be honest with you, even before Milosevic you know, was toppled and went to The Hague, I was very skeptical about the power of evidence in, in achieving this um, reconciliation. But there's something that's more difficult at the heart of, 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 of this process. You know, and, and I'll, t I'll tell you a very brief anecdote, I don't know if we're running out of time, but um, the, oldest, the, oldest, um, the oldest museum in Serbia is the Military Museum. And the military museum uh, was uh, created in the 1950s, and it's kind of divided into two uh, floors, and the ground floor is devoted to military history from the Middle Ages to the end of the First World War, and then the second floor is d dedicated entirely to the history of the Second World War. And that floor has been closed to the public for almost a decade. The reason it's closed to the public is because the government of Serbia said to the directors of the museum, and that's the Serbian army, um, that they have to change the story of the Second World War because it's told too much from a communist perspective. And so the director said to them, no problem, sure. What story do you want us to tell of the Second World War? And then he said, and because Serbia was never officially at war with Bosnia in the 90s, do you want us to add an exhibition on the 90s? And, the <laughs> so, and so the irony is that because the government of Serbia, but this really means the Serbian people, we have no answer to the question of how to tell the story, the floor remains closed. We don't tell the story. And I honestly think, I don't know, I, I've lost all faith in politics, but some, I actually have a lot of faith in storytelling. We need to find a way to tell our story. And I honestly don't think that, you know, until we achieve that, nothing's going to move forward. So it's, you know, it goes beyond politics and courts and, and so on. It goes really fundamentally to how do you tell the story in which all, you know, all of these divided sides can find their, 
can find their place before even starting talking about responsibility and guilt and, and so on. So there is hope, but the hope in my mind is via documentary cinema. It's not via politics. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. Okay. <laughs> That's At a least a positive note. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>